we're going to segue now back to enterprise briefly, and specifically, uh, all of us, I'm sure, touch uh, Google one way or another every day. So we're delighted to have Michael Rubin from Google uh, come on stage. And let me do a, a big, bit of a background and set the, set the scene. Uh, file system development has focused on the needs of desktop and server for decades, but cloud deployments are introducing new challenges and needs for local file systems. And the requirements of this local storage has created both surprises and opportunities. And so we're happy today to have Michael Rubin come on stage and share with us as the lead for Google's kernel storage team, uh, detail Google's experiences and the lessons that they've learned uh, when deploying ext4 throughout the world. Please welcome Michael Rubin. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi. That was a cool intro. I feel almost you know, ready to do this. Um, my name is Mike Rubin. I am the tech lead and manager of Google's kernel storage uh, team for Linux. And today we're going to talk about local file systems in the cloud. So uh, where's the, oh, this is the clicker? Sweet. Ah, all right, so quick context. Um, clouds, people like to say clouds, and they say this magical thing that just takes care of everyone's problems. I, I don't know if I buy that. Um, clouds are a lot of machines that are managed by somebody else. That's my definition. It's quick, it's dirty. Um, they're trusted with important information. So it's not just like Facebook and Amazon and Google now. It's also medical information. It's legal information. Whether we like it or not, they are taking our most pertinent, important bank, financial info, the stuff that really matters, and they're storing it. So that's a cloud storage problem. That's a storage issue. It's a technical problem that needs to be solved. People have our very important data. We want to be able to put it somewhere safe, and we want to get it back out again, preferably the same way it went in. Um, Linux, this, this cloud storage problem is generally managed by a, a big, ah, we'll use this one, because everyone's been using that one, um, a big storage stack. So there's drives at the bottom, there's a Linux file system on top of the drives, or maybe not, but usually there are in these clouds. A local network file system that takes the data off the machine and makes it accessible to other machines. And on top of that, people layer a big distributed file system so they don't have to think about all of the machines individually. This tends to be how most of these large clouds work together to organize their data. Um, the local file system is almost always Linux-based. The OS is always Linux-based. I'd like to say it's because everyone loves Linux and it makes their heart feel good for the community, but the truth is it's because it's free and because it's open. You can see what's going on. There's a large trust issue in the cloud. You don't want to put closed proprietary software inside where there could be a security issue with this very important data. Um, clouds have been studied a lot. Schools talk about it. Distributed systems have come up all over the place. People have done cloud work, cloud work, cloud work. It's, it's common. And some of them have been great, and some of them have been OK, and some of them have helped people get a PhD. Um, local file systems have been studied for a very, very long time. There's ext2, ext3, ext4. Um, there's ButterFS. There's all of these different file systems that have been going on pretty much as soon as we had a hard drive or data to store and organize. What I don't see a lot of is studying whether or not the local file system matters in the cloud. And when I have friends of mine who start startups or friends of mine who put clouds in their garage, um, they want to know what should I use, XFS or ButterFS or EXT, whatever, and they want to know if it matters. Clouds are different. Let's talk about the environments first. So these are the way I kind of, in my own informal view of the world, look at computing environments. You have the desktop. It's about one machine. Enterprise, I'm looking at hundreds of machines. Clouds, we're, when I say cloud now for the rest of this talk, we're talking about tens of thousands of machines. That's the order of magnitude that we're addressing here. Um, the desktop workload, it's pretty varied. People use browsers, video editing. World of Warcraft is a really big one in my house right now. Um, enterprise is very, very focused workloads. People spent a lot of money buying this hardware, and they want to make sure it runs exactly the way they want, and they want to know what's running on the machine. Clouds, varied, 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 varied. And the reason is, generally, you have the infrastructure teams, and you have the apps teams. And if you're lucky, you're in a company where they talk to each other. But if you're not, you know, they sort of have expectations of what each one will do. And the idea is that you want those apps teams to basically go wherever their dreams take them, and you want the infrastructure to be able to support that, just magically. And they never really know where those dreams are going to take those apps guys. So the cloud has to be able to handle all these different workloads. Desktops, generally people don't even use the storage stack in their desktop. It's rare that you actually go beyond 20% disk utilization. Um, enterprise is generally very high, and it can be bursty or it can be constant. And if you're, you know, if you have a well organized enterprise installation. I know there's some out there that maybe they paid more than they need. Um, clouds, you want the utilization as high as possible and constant. 
because services generally are 24-7 all over the world. And in addition, you want to get the most money you invested in that hardware. All right, so how's the storage stack look? What's the storage differences in these environments? Um, desktops, generally it's one drive or maybe one SSD. Uh, enterprise, you spend a lot of money buying good hardware. You have a hard problem to solve and it's very focused. So you may get RAID arrays, dual home drives, uh, um, fiber channel installations. You invest in expertise and cutting edge technology to make the performance and the management simple. And then cloud, cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap commodity. You want capacity. You need to store as much as possible. You never want a cloud where you put in your information and it goes full. You don't want eno space on a cloud. It's not acceptable. So you optimize for capacity. And that means generally the cheapest per gigabyte you can get. The support model is a thing I think people don't think about a lot of. Um, so my support model for the desktop, at least everyone I know, it's one to many. I support all the computers in my house, and my mom, and my dad, and my grandparent, and my uncle, and our neighbor who found out I worked at a computer company who comes by now and asks questions every weekend when he sees me mowing the lawn. So, that's kind of a one-to-many relationship. It's an amateur, generally. Not, you don't pay someone to take care of the computer in your home. Enterprise is different. You pay high-skilled professionals, I'm sorry, highly-skilled professionals, in order to <laughs> make sure your hardware works. You generally have bad consequences if it doesn't. The cloud is the same. Um, well, the support model is, again, you get another band of people who are highly paid and highly skilled, but they're not supporting hundreds of machines. They're supporting tens of thousands of machines. Now, that doesn't freak you out. I'm betting you haven't done enough storage work. Because um, I get freaked out doing the one-to-many at my house. Reliability is also a very different approach. Uh, desktops, they depend on luck. The odds are my hard drive isn't going to explode today. It'll probably be some guy I heard about at the office, ha, 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 on him. But I'm OK. That's what most people do. If you're really good, you back it up to another drive. That may explode to you tomorrow also. Um, Enterprise, they invest in high-end hardware, and they expect it to work. They have tape backups. They have robots to move the tape. It's an amazing system that's highly involved and highly invested for reliability. Clouds, they copy. We have so much space. Why spend all that money that you can't scale anyway or manage? Just make lots of copies. Put some over here, put some over there, put some over there. If you lose some, well, there's probably a copy over there. You're OK. Replication. RAM for the storage. How do you allocate the RAM? Well, desktops, you generally have more RAM than you need. Um, enterprise, often you invest RAM in many different levels. You have high-end drives with bigger caches. You have RAID arrays with lots of RAM. You have servers with lots of RAM. And clouds are different. They have what I call limited RAM. Now, there are two types of clouds out there, and the rest of this talk we'll be talking about shared clouds. Uh, dedicated cloud is when you have one job per machine. But as the clouds get bigger, you don't get good utilization that way. So you start sharing the machines to do different things at once. This leads to this situation. Um, infrastructure that you put on every single machine in your fleet gets very expensive. So if I can run all of my file system in 20 megabytes, that's not that much. But if I take that 20 megabytes and I multiply it by the billion and trillion and zillion and gajillion and other big numbers, suddenly it's really expensive. And I go, can I do it in 10? Five, five would be great. And you start looking at the limits of the resource footprint, and you want to shrink it as small as possible so you can then afford to leverage the rest of those resources for the applications. Yeah, I think I did this slide. Huzzah. OK, local file systems matter. We're going to go to this slide now because it's a new one, and I think it's fair to go back and forth. Um, this is the software stack at Google. It's pretty much like the one we talked about before, except we have something called Big Table that we put on top. We have tens of thousands of machines running around. And on top of that, we have a distributed file system. And on top of that, we have a sort of a database layer called Bigtable. There's a lot of papers about it. Please go read them. It's, it's pretty cool. Jeff Dean's brilliant. Um, but in 2008, right when I started getting involved in Google Storage, we, I noticed we were using ext2 for all of our local storage. You know, why still the ext2? We had a lot of new file systems by that point. Um, the big reason was that no one really measured the benefit or the detriment. It was just kind of there, taken for granted. The other reason was it stored all of our data. No one really wanted to mess with it. <laughs> Because if you messed up the file system on all of those machines, it's kind of hard to get the state back that you lost. Um, the other reason is that the whole company was based on the fundamental assumption of ext2. So even if something was broken, all these apps were set up to deal with that brokenness and expect that brokenness. Changing that, you'd have to be crazy. You'd have to be out of your mind. You'd have to be insane. And luckily, we have people like that at Google. So this was a poster that was made when we started looking at this problem. Um, in 2008, Chad Talbot, who was sitting right over there, uh, and I started measuring the behavior of ext2 in the cloud to see if it made a difference or not. 
Um, EXT2 manages its data with something called the system indirect blocks. Oh, man. And uh, basically, it spreads its data around, and as the files get bigger, it needs to allocate more metadata. There's lots of really good articles about how this works online. Pretty cool to, to read them. Um, the big thing to remember is more metadata as the files get larger, and you end up seeking around the disk a lot more as the files get larger. We did some experiments, and we found out on our indexing workload, which was running a little slower than we had expected, what was going on. And we found that the metadata traffic was 40% of our workload. So half the time when we were trying to get data from the system, we spent it getting the data to help us get to the data to get to the data on the system. It didn't feel efficient. And it explained some things. Um, we generally hoped that out of a hard drive, we'd get 20 millisecond latencies out of our operations. We weren't getting that. We were getting, for to remove an 8 megabyte file, we took 800 seconds. That's a long time under heavy load and with memory pressure. We had to wait a while to remove a file. Um, this was more than just a metadata ratio problem. And we looked into it some more on disks that were not 90% full. We found that the allocator and some other problems in EXT2 led to lots of fragmentation. So much so that a 4 kilobyte read could take longer than 100 milliseconds it's doing like three to maybe eight disk accesses. Our engineers in Appland were looking for one access. And they'd come by my office, and they'd go, something's, something's wrong. And I'd be like, no, 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 it's beautiful, it's ext 2 No, it's taking longer than it should. And they were right. Um, the workaround some of the apps guys did was to read in all of the inodes into RAM, come up with their own mapping, and then ignore the file system when it came to reading for their latency queries. And they got really good latency that way, but they also wasted a lot of memory that way. What could go wrong in the cloud? Well, I put threats in the cloud in two buckets. There's event threats, the machine loses power, the machine crashes, and we need to restart and get that data back as soon as possible and make sure it's all still there. EXT2 does reasonably well on this. 90% of the errors of FSCK drives were fixed. Fine, no problem, got all the data back. The downside was the availability. It could take 85 minutes for an FSCK after some of these workloads have crashed. Now, 85 minutes, if you think about it, is like me giving my talk three times in a row, which is something I wish on nobody to have to sit through and wait for. Three episodes of The Bill Cosby Show. It's a long time. And if you have tens of thousands of machines waiting that long, well, then suddenly you wonder if you made the best investment. Traffic resilience. As you send data to and from the drive, is it losing the data? Is it corrupting the data? Are there problems with the data? Replication is really cool, and it takes care of a lot of problems. But if just getting through the day involves losing data and going to the replication answer, it becomes very expensive. Suddenly, a lot of your storage is unavailable. A lot of your hardware investment is no longer useful. And the systems that do the replication get overloaded, because they only expect so many problems. The XT2 did great on this. It was very, very stable. We didn't really have a lot of file system errors. And when we did have a problem, the community had probably already fixed it upstream. We could take that change and patch it in, and it was, this was fantastic. Not only that, ext 2 didn't change that much, so we didn't have to worry about that much churn from upstream. Um, oh, did I miss one? No, we're good. Given the performance problems, we decided to start looking at other file systems and see if they make a difference. And this is a selection list we came up with. We ignored file systems that did not have a strong user base or a strong community involvement because we wanted to make sure that we have a group of people to work with and help us and help themselves and people we could interact with for file system support. So this got rid of RiserFS, JFS, and the amazing number of homemade file systems people both in and out of Google told me about. Um, we wanted something stable. We wanted something that we could trust. So we took a look at them. Um, ButterFS, ext 3 ext 4 XFS, and ZFS. ButterFS looks awesome, but in 2008, it wasn't ready yet. We couldn't put the company's future on ButterFS at that point. Um, EXT3, it was journaled, it was very simple to manage, but it uses indirect blocks for allocation, so it has many of the same problems of EXT2. Um, EXT4 performed a lot better, it was simple, it had a journal, and had a neat feature that you could upgrade EXT2 in place without migrating any of the data. Um, it wasn't the highest performer on our list, XFS was. It performed beautifully. It had every feature in the book. It was gorgeous. It was also 100,000 lines of code whereas ext4 was about 20 or 30 at that point. Um, we had problems benchmarking it because we didn't understand it well enough to know what all knobs and, and tunables to, to, to change and fix. Um, it was complex, and we began to realize if it's too complex for us to manage, asking someone to put it on tens of thousands of machines and manage it seemed a little difficult. 
ZFS. ZFS, it seems like the dream file system. It's got everything. It's got replication. It's got volume management. It's got resiliency up the wazoo. It also has licensing issues. Um, I couldn't find a lawyer at Google who said it was okay to use it. We took it off the list. <laughs> we chose EXG4. Um, took us two and a half years to deploy it. Now, why did it take us that long? Well, the biggest reason was that we really care about not losing data. If data comes into the cloud, we can't lose it. We have to preserve it. We can't make things slow in accessing it. It was very, very careful. It's akin to pulling the tablecloth off a table and having all of the glasses and silverware stay still while people are eating. That takes time. Um, also, file systems upgrades are one way. So when you go to the Gmail team and say, we're going to do something to your system and you can't undo it if it's wrong, they get nervous. They want to see a lot of validation. They want to see power fail testing, the reliability numbers. They want to see upgrade configurations working A-OK. -okay. And we did this work. Um, we started with tens of machines, hundreds of machines, got to thousands and tens of thousands, and it took time, but we got there. On top of that, um, I think next time it's going to take a lot less time. This was the first one. That fundamental assumption change was a very big hump to um, come over. And basically, it's like going from single-threaded to multi-threaded to multi-core. Those later steps are a little easier. Um, so it's 2011 now. It is today. No data loss has occurred due to this upgrade to our knowledge, which is sort of a nice achievement. Um, we're at 87% coverage of Google right now. Why 87%? Gmail is careful. They're about halfway through their upgrade right now, and they're just taking their time to really make sure everything looks good before they're all done. Uh, they're very happy right now. They've seen a lot of performance improvements. And also, there's a whole bunch of code in the company that uses ext2-specific flags. So we have to go off and fix this. And we waited a bit before we did that. Um, the first thing we noticed was on that same workload that I showed you before in indexing, the metadata ratio got a lot better. We're down to 4% to data, <laughs> as opposed to 40 to 60. And they saw performance improvements that, that went along with this. Um, this isn't true for all of the workloads. We still see under generic shared workloads about a 10 to 20% ratio, I mean, meaning 10 to 20% metadata to data. So there's still work to be done, and we're doing some. Um, the impact on the network. So we, I, anybody can go now and see comparisons between ext4 and ButterFS and ext2. It, it's not really rocket science. There's tons of stuff on the net. But did it affect anything else at Google? Did it make that software stack any better? The answer is it looks like it did. The network file system operations, um, comparing ext2 to ext4, we saw read operations writes almost double the performance of the drive. It was fundamentally very surprising to us. We didn't think it was going to be that good. We thought there'd be some layer in between that would stop up some of that performance. Removes also improved by about 60%. Distributed file system, a layer above that we thought would be completely not involved in any performance improvements at all. We thought it would just be sort of sopped up by memory and caches. We saw 60% improvements in writes, uh, 30 in reads. Random writes also saw about a 30%, and record appends saw 20. Also, the tails and latencies of all of these workloads got a lot better. So not only did the system get faster, it got more predictable. That's huge. We'll talk more about that later. Um, big table and the web search. Uh, big table, like I said, is a high level piece of software. Um, we saw, a, oh, these are latency charts, by the way. So latency means down is better. Um, I even wrote it there, but most of the people I've shown this to didn't read that thing at the bottom. Um, latency got a third better for both of these workloads. That means a disk based search occurred in a 60% of the time sorry, that it took before. These are enormous gains that people at Google would spend a lot of time trying to get 5%, they'd be happy. We took about a half a dozen engineers in the Linux community, and boom, tens of percent performance improvement. File systems matter. But we learned some things, too. We learned that the requirements for the cloud are a little bit more complex than we originally thought. I thought it was just reliability and performance. Um, visibility is a very, very big deal. When you're managing tens of thousands of systems, you need to know things like, What's going on? Um, is the buffer data safe on disk yet? Is there one application hogging the performance of all the other ones? Um, what's the metadata to data ratio? Did we hit some corner case now, which is explaining why we're having bad performance? Um, what is going on? Why are things slow? Is it even in the file system, or is it VFS? Is the dcache blown up? It's a very, very difficult problem when you want predictable performance from your storage stack to understand and root cause these issues, especially when you have many of them. You need to do it in aggregate. Um, 
example of a problem that we had. We deployed EXT4 uh, to tens of thousands of machines after some early testing, and we were so happy. It looked great. Everything was fantastic. And if you just keep reading the slide, you can tell, um, some people have because they're smiling, that we were corrupting data at a very, very ferocious rate. Um, Linux was telling us this in the D message, but that's not how we found out. We found it because the repair systems woke up and said, something's wrong with all of these systems, and we have to repair them at a very ferocious rate. Um, but we found out the problem long after we should have, and as a result, what could have been something fixed easily took an enormous amount of effort to keep things under control. Now, this was a test cluster. No data was harmed. Everyone's Gmail is safe. Um, but this visibility can make the difference between an annoyance and something that you fix quickly and a catastrophe. Um, another problem with just debugging state in general is you have a file system version one, and then you put on two, three, and four, and then around five you see a corruption, and you don't know where it came from, and you don't know which one should fix it, and you're not really sure if you should reformat all your data or if you just need to put in a hot fix for that one fix of corruption. Now, on your desktop, you can just MKFS it and move on. When you're in these situations, you can't. It's just too much data. Just doing that can take weeks. Predictable requirement. It's very important that your local file system, that fundamental brick, is predictable. Your application developers expect it to be. They expect generally 20 millisecond operations when they think they're doing one disk access. Um, what we found was that there's a lot of dimensions to this. When we gave the file server or the, the kernel memory five gigs to play with, wonderful predictable performance. When we give them half a gig to play with, we see odd jumps, spikes, latency, problems, unreliableness. That's not a word. Um, half a second to two second latencies. In this case, it, it happened even worse because it only happens sometimes. So the problem is with a lot of these queries is you'll send out 20 jobs to 20 systems, and then they all wait for all of them to be done before they give the answer. So two stragglers can really hurt the performance of all of the other jobs. And knowing when and where this would happen is, is invaluable. Um, in this case, metadata paging was a problem, and it was solved in software, and we're able to keep moving on, no problem. Hardware abstraction. So this is a topic of itself. I, I think we've heard about this all day. Flash, PCM, SATA drives, I mean, SS SATA attached flash. The, the world of storage is changing at a very ferocious rate. And the kernel needs to provide one simple abstraction. So the application people need to think more of the performance they need and less of, oh, I need my bytes to be on this piece of metal versus that piece of metal. In the cloud, this is very important so that you can shift things around underneath the application guys and they don't have to worry about it. It's a layer of abstraction that is uh, it's important to have. Um, is journaling required? Of all the things in the file system, this is the one question that people feel emotional about. Um, journaling, for some reason, is close to people's hearts. It turns out on the local network file system uh, benchmarks we've had with ext4, we have four different flavors of journaling here. No journal ordered, write back an async commit. And it looks like we lose about a quarter to 30% of our throughput performance using the journal. That's a lot. Um, but journals are really cool. You can restart in a very short amount of time. You end up with a coherent file system. You know that five seconds before now, your data has been committed correctly. It gives you a predictable view of your state and what is going to happen when you have to reboot. It lets you know what's persistent or not. And the downside in the cloud, though, is the performance hit. It actually uses the drive much more than, um, than not having one. You have to do more operations to disk. Infrequent, you know, the cloud doesn't reboot the systems that often. We have replication. And now at the XT4, at Google at least, we see that the average FSK time is about five minutes per terabyte. Right now, the decision we've made is to not deploy the journal but we need to revisit it, because having that predictable behavior is very, 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 very cool, especially in the cloud. Today and tomorrow. So this is the XT4 team at Google. Um, Aditya, Kali, Akshay Lal, Chad Talbot, Kurt Volgamuth, Frank Mayer, Jiang Zhang, Ted Cho. They've been working really hard for several years in order to make all this work happen. You can see all of their names in Git commits upstream. Our EXT4 at Google looks very, very close to what upstream has, um, and we try very hard to keep that going. The XT4 team is actually much larger than that. You can see that in 2003, Luster started working on patches for MB alloc, delayed allocation, and extents, which is a large part of the XT4. And in 2006, Ted Cho started working on EXT4 more formally for the community. And here's a list of some of the large contributors to EXT4. If you notice, a lot of them have a name that begins with A. And <laughs> that's eerie. I didn't notice that before. <laughs> OK. And um, 
a lot of them have names that begin with A, and uh, they, they come from many different companies, which is very important. And the reason I think it's important is because I think Linux is the best place to do this work for the cloud. Linux is probably going to be the only solution deployed in most clouds around the world, and no one company is going to have all the answers. We need to be able to pool the information we have to understand how to solve this problem of this new technical challenge that Linux has. And we can do a much better job than we're doing, but what we've done already is pretty awesome. Um, there's an opportunity here to build beautiful systems that tell you when things are wrong before you know it, that let you see exactly into the behavior of your storage stack and let you understand the best way to maximize the investment that you've made. The ability to have a predictable system so that you can just, like I think we talked about it earlier with the, um, um, the, uh, the, the audio presentation, the fact that real time or predictable or having good strong guarantees of what resources you put into the system will give you some performance when you get out. It's very important. And dealing with the hardware diversity that used to belong to enterprise, which is now here for everyone, desktop and cloud, has got cheap. Making that simple. And so it's not another headache, which makes management and visibility even harder. You don't need a cloud to address these issues. Any, anyone can work on this. So that's kind of my talk. Local file systems do impact the cloud, so if there's any business people here building their clouds, they should think about this. EXT4 ended up rocking EXT2. Linux, I think, is the only solution to this problem. I, I was giving this talk, actually, as a dry run to a bunch of people from uh, my friends who work on Solaris a lot, and they, they kind of kowtowed and said, yeah, Linux is probably a good way to address this problem, too. Um, Thank you all very much, and uh, thanks to everybody for listening this long. We do have a couple minutes for questions, probably one or two. Would anyone like to ask Michael anything specific? Or did you already cover it at the Storage and File Systems Summit on Monday and Tuesday? Or is everyone really hungry? Well, I am glad to know that all of my 13-month-old uh, son's photos on the Picasso web albums are safe and secure. So it was really exciting to hear all how what you're doing with ext4, Michael. And we really thank you for taking the time to come speak with thank us. You. Oh, wait, question. Yes. Is there lessons learned? due to the, oh, the recent Gmail corruption story that made the news and they had it all on tape and got back most of the data, that one. Um, I'm not part of that team, per se. Generally, when I interact with them, it has to deal with more what's going on in the storage issue, how they're interacting with the operating system. So, I mean, honestly, I think you probably know about as much as I do, which is they, they made a mistake high up in the storage stack. Um, they have tape backed up and ready to go to deal with those mistakes. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you with that much. Yeah, I don't know what you're looking for either. Like, you know, don't make mistakes or come up with a new process or, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I don't have enough information on that. Any yeah, they other? don't let me out much. <laughs> uh, sure. Yes. Oh, everybody lies. Everybody lies. So there's this lesson when we get new, new people in the team, I'm, I tell them, like, you know, hard drives will lie to you and the hardware will lie to you, and the OS will lie to you, and we lie to other people accidentally. Um, you know, I, I think the, the nature of the thing to remember is, you know, we had a hard drive guy come to the, the storage workshop, and he was awesome. He was fantastic. And one of the things he really impressed upon me again is how complex a hard drive is. A hard drive is a little mini miracle. It's like a genie in a box, if you think of what it does. And then, but it's, it's hard to get that working right consistently all the time. And so, you know, there will be firmware problems. All that complexity, the things on the edges will, will bleed out. And I think that that holds true not just for hard drives, but for operating systems and applications. And if you're going to endeavor to do anything very cool, usually you have to embrace complexity to some degree or deal with complexity. And there, the, the, the side effect of that is it's complex and things, things get wrong. So yes, the hard drives lie to us a lot. And one of the things that I should have mentioned was in that storage stack, each one of those pieces doesn't trust the one below it. So there are layers of checksumming and there's layers of validation. And we, I think people talk a lot about stuff in the clouds and how do you make sure that you don't lose the data. My answer is not just to have that level of distrust, but when you have those, the, the validation code that you're, you're writing, make sure it's written by different people so that you have very different perspectives on 
how to ensure that your data is, um, has integrity. And uh, in that case, it's actually you don't want the people working together. You want them to kind of dis, uh, disinvolve. Does that answer your question? OK. Sure. I'll be here like forever, and I have no life, so I'll answer anything. Um, <laughs> anything else anyone wants to ask? Yeah. What network file systems do we use? Uh, they have, well, for your desktop at work, I think you know, we use NFS and things like that. But in the cloud, it's proprietary. I mean, I, you can actually read about this stuff online. Go read about GFS. Go read about Bigtable. They'll give you much more detail than, than I can provide for you. But um, in general, it's, it's proprietary stuff, both security and flexibility, and just to scale. Yeah? OK. I think, OK, so the, the question is, and I believe, let me see if I understand it is, in this deep software stack, when you have an application that issues a, a write request and then closes and dies and gets killed or something, correct? Oh, right, because there's levels of acknowledgment all the ways down. Um, are you asking, do we drop the data, or how do we acknowledge that we've? Well, I, well yeah. It, I don't know. And it says, oh, damn, because the data's. No, oh, damn, hardware, because I've got an error. Oh, um, replication. So normally what happens is it's not like you trust uh, that one pizza. So it's like cabs. I took a cab last night, and I saw this guy who I thought was really not cool. Um, he was at the cab stop, and there were, he, he got off the train, got on the street, and there were three cabs waiting for him. And I couldn't believe it. And I go, wow, you're really lucky. He goes, no, I call three just to make sure I get one. And you know he got in one cab, and the other guy cursed at him in some language I don't know. And um, so the the point is I, that's kind of the same. You know, when you have this much capacity, you basically shoot your um, your IOs off to for many, so that if one doesn't work, it's okay. And then there are acknowledgement paths for different levels of SLA where you are waiting for the acknowledgement. You know, and then it gets complicated with different forms of um, communication. But does that answer your question? Okay, we can talk later. Yeah, great. Thanks, Michael, again. We're going to have a 15-minute break. Reconvene at 4.15. For those that want to grab Michael, catch him outside. See you in 15 minutes.